As I mentioned before, uh, we had the pleasure of hearing our brother Roger Anderson speak to us this morning on the topic of Jacob, a diamond in the rough. And in further pre pre preparation for his remarks, he's asked that we read from Genesis chapter 47, and we'll be reading verses 7 through 10. Reading together from Genesis chapter 47, beginning at the seventh verse. Then Joseph brought it in his father Jacob and set him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, how old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. So Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. At this time, I'll ask for your quiet and careful attention as our brother Roger speaks to us on Jacob, a diamond in the rough. morning brethren always good to be here and every time I'm I'm up here it seems there's five more than there were the time before so we're, we're slowly getting back it's just good to see so many I think the last time I spoke it was five people sitting out there so it's uh comforting to see things just a little more like home Jacob a diamond in the rough um I was a a while back, few, actually a few years ago, I was inspired to write this talk when I had the opportunity to teach about Jacob uh, twice in a short period of time. I think I had a Sunday school class and some other class I was teaching and I'd never really put much time into his life. Um, and each time I read the story, I saw a man that I realized I did not know as well as I thought I did. Even though I grew up with him all my life, as all of us have, we've all grown up with Jacob. Um, and uh, the road that he traveled was much more complicated than I had previously understood. Of course, as we get older and we learn about the trials of life and the hardships of life and, and the struggles of life, we start to connect with people in the Bible a little more when we uh, experience some of our own. I found... Um, if I had personally known him in his early life, I would have probably had very little respect for him if I had crossed his path when he was maybe 20 years old. But as his life unfolded, I saw a man like us who had many rough edges to be removed through the trials he went through by the providential hand of God. And I think as we look at this, we're all going to find something in it we can connect with if you haven't already. In his core being, there was a man named Israel, prince with God. That's what Israel means, prince with God. Um, and it's going to be hard to apply that to him in the first few things that we read about him, which we, many of us know the stories well, but it would take 20 years to bring that man to the surface. I would like this morning to present his life as if we were skipping a stone across a lake. And each place a stone hits is a moment or turning point in his life. So we're, his, he covers about six, eight chapters, but we're not gonna read all that, but I'm just gonna hit the highlights. And it's even by doing that, you see the transition. It's an amazing story. Um, and it would change him into the man he was destined to be. Now, to begin with, um, this is what I always thought as a very young uh, man growing up. It's, it's changed a lot since then. Uh, when your father is a patriarch or man of God, uh, we may have a tendency to automatically stereotype the kids as being probably, they're really great kids. I mean, when your father's a patriarch, I mean, got it. You got to come out right, all right? You it just you got to come out right. Uh, being a man of God, though, uh, as much as I even tried to be, I realized the challenges with that whole uh, scenario. God doesn't 
uh, being a man of God doesn't make raising kids any easier. I mean, I, you have a tendency to put them on a pedestal and uh, their lives are totally different, separate from marriage, but that's not so. Uh, they go through the same learning curves as all of us do in raising children. Of course, as we know, David's, not all of David's kids turned out well. Uh, one of them wanted to kill him and two of them wanted to overthrow him. What, what happened there? Uh, we don't have time to go into it. And of course, we know um, how Eli's sons turned out and Samuel's sons, um, especially Samuel. You know, both his boys did not turn out well. Um, some children will never accept the ways of righteousness. Others will have great struggles before they do. And I believe that Jacob is one of those people. Um, now, when Jacob and Esau come on the scene after their birth, uh, they are already grown, and it starts right in on the birthright conflict. Uh, nothing is said about them growing up together as little kids, six, seven, eight years old, and maybe picking on each other and anything like that. But they're born, and in the next few verses, there is a, a horrible conflict going on. Uh, how did things break down this bad in this early part of their life between these two boys. What was the catalyst that set things in motion? Uh, and I'll suggest to you, and I, I, I might get a, a few gasps, I don't know, but it was in the parenting skills of Isaac and Rebecca, if you really read the story. And that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, for those who wish to follow along, I'm just going to be reading the highlights. We're going to start in Genesis 25, starting with verse 20, just a couple, few verses here and there. Uh, Genesis 25, uh, verses 27 to 28. And we all know the story well, but when you connect the dots, it's interesting. It says, And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. That verse right there should jump right off the page at us. That favoritism, uh, having special relationships with a child, uh, one parent over the other. I definitely detect a, a, a spirit of favoritism. Um, there was something in the character of these boys that drew the different parents to the one something they liked about them where they, maybe the love was a little out of balance between. It wasn't smooth, it wasn't equal across the way. Um, but if, if you don't think so, just we'll see where it goes. But it definitely wrote this verse in here for a reason. There was some favoritism taking place and we know it gets worse as it goes. How would this affect two boys growing up? I know how it, We've all seen where some children are outcast and where the others are favored. We, we, we've all heard these kind of stories. And I can't imagine how it would have affected mine, where they would be right now if we had allowed that. Why did Jacob not seem to love Esau, at least as best as we can tell? Perhaps he competed for his father's approval. We know he wasn't a hunter. Maybe he hated hunting. Maybe he was lousy at it. Maybe he that just totally couldn't stand the sight of blood. I don't know, but he was not a hunter. And that's something that Isaac really saw that he liked in Esau. And obviously he favored because he got this food that he enjoyed. Remember Joseph was the favorite and how he was treated. And actually Jacob was the one that did that. Favoritism, as we know, can cause serious resentment between siblings and it's very, emotionally destructive and these are the lessons that we learn from this and even the the greatest men of the bible went through these struggles all right let's continue on and genesis uh same uh same uh chapter is picking up with the very next ver uh, verse we come to the birthright situation so in verse 29 he says it says, and Jacob saw it pottage, and Esau came in the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with the same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, sell me this day your birthright. And Esau said, behold, I am point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do me? 
And Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swore unto him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread, pottage, and lentils. He did eat and drink and rose up and went away. Thus Esau despised his birthright. We've all grown up with this story uh, since we were children. But what would you... What would you think of me if I did that to my brother? You all know Tim, at least most of you do. Uh, what, if, what if I told Tim I wasn't going to let him have a meal unless he cut me a deal? If, if you even heard that, that I wouldn't feed him unless he, he, sold, he, he, he anted up something, you would think horrible. I, I would be getting some very nasty emails, I'm sure I would. Um, it's, it's, it's very controlling, isn't it? Uh, perhaps even life-threatening in this situation because he thought he might die. He was willing to give up a lot. And here was a man who was a hunter. He must have been in a situation where food was scarce in his life, or at least in his house. Um, and it's certainly not love that Jacob was showing, perhaps even hatred. It's kind of, you've really got to think about it. Esau was in a very vulnerable position, and Jacob seized upon it. We, it's very clear what happened here. He's seizing upon a moment where he can get something. Again, you think about Prince with God. Where's that name going to fit here? But it's there. What I'm trying to do is establish where Jacob was spiritually at this point in his life. It set the tone of what was to be purged from his character. And that's what this is about. Uh, and what I'll do, I'll try to show why he had to go through what he went through and why we do also in our life, because we can all connect with something in this story. Let's move ahead to chapter 27, starting with the sixth verse. Like I say, we're just skipping along. Um, starting with the sixth verse of chapter 27, the next situation that arises, the stolen blessing as we know of. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me the venison, and make me savory meat, that I may eat, and bless thee before the Lord, um, before the Lord, before any death. Um, excuse me, I read that. That I may eat, and bless thee before the Lord, before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, according to all which I have commanded thee. Go to the flock, and fetch me from the thence two kids of goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, Esau is my brother. He is a hairy man, and I am smooth man. My father, peradventure, will feel me, and shall, shall seem unto him as a deceiver. And I shall bring a curse upon me, and not a blessing. And his mother said unto him, Upon me... Be thy curse, my son. Only obey my voice and go fetch me them. And he went and fetched and brought them unto his mother, and his mother made savory meat, such as father loved. Now, we've already seen that Jacob isn't of the best character at this time and what he, he is willing to do to his brother. The bond must have been very, very strong with his mother. This is that how favoritism you, you get this uh, uh, separating of one being drawn to the other more and not a balance. That he was actually willing to carry this out. He's not a little kid. He's not a 12-year-old kid is doing what his mama tells him to do. He, he's old enough to support himself. Yet we've already seen what he's capable of. What was going on through his mind as he went and got that calf? Kind of wonder that whole process of this, this is all taking place. The past, there might have been a conflict with his soul or spirit, or maybe he was just trying to figure, boy, how are we going to pull this off? He was taking advantage of a blind old man who had provided for him. Think about that. A blind old man who had provided for him. He was going to lie to his father. Premeditated. Let's continue on. If we go... Uh, at, this is a very emotionally charged incident for all members. Each person that comes into this picture has a whole set of their own emotions that they're dealing with. And they're all extremely intense. Uh, 
ones that we would encourage anyone to get counseling who was going through it. Um, if we jump to verse 30, um, and it came to pass as soon as the blessing has all, he's already blessed Jacob, uh, not knowingly. That's why I'm, I'm jumping over, but we want to get to the real crux of it. And it came to pass as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob, and Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, uh, that Esau, his brother, came in from honey, and he also had made savory meat and brought it unto his father and said unto his father, let my father arise and eat my, his son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And Isaac, his father, said unto him, who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn Esau. Uh, and Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who? Where is the, he that hath taken venison and brought it to me? And I have eaten of all that before thou camest and have blessed him, yea, and he shall be blessed. Isaac is trembling. Okay, here's another set of emotions that is coming into the mix. Think about at, at what points do we tremble? What, what makes us tremble? And I, I really thought about this. Um, if you've ever been in a situation where you felt yourself shaking, and not because you're getting sick or something like that, but because of the circumstances that are unfolding around you, it's usually under great stress or fear. And if there's another one, I'm not sure what it would be. But most in my world so far, though, what I've experienced is that's when I've trembled. Um, he realized, that's Isaac, had realized something has happened here. Uh, because he understands what God had promised him uh, um, with the things that would come with his, his son. And then we read uh, verse 34 going on. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, bless me, even me, O my father. And he said, thy brother came with subtility and has taken away thy blessing. And he said, is, it not, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? And as you could see his, his anger dwell in. He already had a lot of resentment, but this is, this is big. This is the biggest day of his life. It's suddenly been taken away. Um, and you can see, it says he cried with a bitter cry. You could just see him shouting it out, not just, oh man, dad, that's not good. No, he's, this is very emotionally charged. And verse 38, um, and Esau said unto his father, hast thou one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, oh my father. And it says that Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Uh, we perhaps even we could apps, even see his with his maybe his head in, in Isaac's lap. This was one of the most important moments in his life, and it had been taken from him. Yet it's interesting. We see Isaac is not voiding the blessing. We know from then on that he thought to kill Jacob. It, we don't. Oh, I want to say we don't see Isaac getting mad. That boy of mine, when I get my hands on him for coming in here and doing that, it was nothing like that. He realized, I think he realized that God was in this. And this is the route they had to take with these boys. Because there seems to be no anger on Isaac's part. He just trembled. That's not, you know, that's not anger. That's, you're experiencing something that's very big going on. And I think he was connecting the dots of what had happened. As we know from, from then on, he, uh, Esau thought to kill Jacob. All those years of conflict between them had come to a head. And it is my understanding that when a man is angry and crying, he's dangerous. If you've ever seen somebody in that situation, he's dangerous because he could do anything. He can kill. Um, that, this is what's taking place. This isn't just happening around the dinner table. This is, this is big. Then I can, 
then I can't help but think how Rebecca must feel about what she's instigated. She realizes that in the process of trying to control the outcome of one child's life, you may have made the other one want to kill him. You ever think about that emotion that now she's going through? She was all trying to get this blessing thing straight, but now one of her children, because of what she did, wants to kill the other one. Can you imagine either one of your children, these children out here, if one wanted to kill the other one? I mean, I don't mean just punch them once. I mean, remove their life from them and take them out. How would that affect you as a mother? Um, and we can only imagine what it would do to the soul of any mother. We can only imagine. And we get a hint of that in verses uh, 43 and 45 of the same chapter. Um, uh, it says, now, therefore, my son, obey my voice, arise and flee to Laban and my brother in Haran and tarry with him a few days until thy brother's fury turn away, until thy brother's anger turn away from thee and, I, and he forget that which thou, had, thou hast done to him. Then I will send and fetch thee from thence. Why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? She, she realized she lost, she's lost Esau's love. Here, if he kills Jacob, she loses him, but now he's going to hate as much she feels he's going to hate me for what I've done. Throw all that in the pot. You got this pot that's getting bigger and bigger all the time of all of these things that these uh, people are going through. She believes that she has lost Esau, uh, the love of Esau, um, even though it doesn't... Um, it's not recorded. She believes that's happened. Um, what would Esau think of his mother after this? I, I can only imagine those conversations. There are just some of the emotions that are running through each character. Each one of these people is being developed. But uh, Jacob is the uh, centerpiece of all this. They are, each one is dealing with something different. And it really makes for a volatile uh, and dysfunctional family. Think about how dysfunctional this is at this time in their lives. All right, so next, uh, but, uh, we're gonna jump to uh, Genesis 28, verse 11. By this time, Jacob has fled, and this is where God intervenes uh, with him. Uh, starting with verse 11, uh, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set and he took of the stones of that place and put them up for pillows and lay down in the place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father and the God of Isaac and the land whereon thou liest to thee will I give it and to thy seed and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south and in thee shall all the shall the, the thy seed show all the families of the earth be blessed behold i am with thee and i will keep thee in all the places where thou goest and i will bring thee again unto the land and i will not leave thee until i have done that which i have spoken of thee well uh, most likely this is the first communication that we know of that God has had with Jacob. Um, he, I'm sure that he had heard stories from his father, his life, his grandfather, and all of those stories, but it seems like this is maybe the first real contact. And pick up here a little bit of God's mercy. After all he did, the lying to his father, the letting, cutting that deal with the birthright, that type of heart, God never condemns him. He never says, you're going to pay a price for that. He, he's offering him uh, this future that I will be with thee. God knows the work, the struggle that he's in and that he's brought it on himself. Uh, but yet none of that comes up. None of that. That's very interesting. All right, verse 16. Um, he's in the same chapter. And Jacob waked out of the sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Oh, he was afraid. He's starting now to have some emotions about something else now. 
um, I would imagine this is a very life altering moment. This is that point where, okay, you're now out here all by yourself and you've lost everything. Now you're ready for my hands, what I'm going to do with you. And you would never be the same after that. Uh, remember Samson's parents, when they saw the angel, they thought they were gonna die. Um, this might be how we would respond, I don't know. Uh, but he was very afraid uh, of what had taken place. But look at this, when we go in, in verse 20, here's where, this is very interesting about Jacob's state of mind and where he is in all of this. And it took me years before I ever saw it. Verse 20, he says, and Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in the way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house, then shall the Lord be my God. And you can read right over that and that sounds great. He's, he's turning around, look what he, but this is where I get the first hint of him really being at a crossroads of life. And up to this point, based on the behavior we've already seen with his brother, that he was not at all committed to God's service. I always assumed that because he was Isaac's boy, he was always committed, um, committed to God. But even after this dream from God, if I don't know if you've picked it up, but notice his vow is conditional. This is, this is really interesting to show where he is. He says, if God bring me to my father in peace, then he shall be my God. And I'm thinking, wasn't he already your God? It seems he hadn't totally bought into this Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob thing yet. He hadn't seen his place in all of that. And he's right now at a crossroads where now, okay, I'm listening. Keep talking, Lord, I'm listening now. At least he's listening. But I, I thought that was extremely big in understanding the story. Then uh, the next place we jump to in chapter 29, we come to the Uncle Laban story. Good old Uncle Laban. Maybe at some point in life we've all met a Laban, if you really look at this guy and, and what he was um, and how he thought and how he worked. Um, he was a man with a hidden agenda for Jacob, and Jacob was on a need-to-know basis only. Keep that in mind. How would you like to be on a need-to-know basis only, even in your marriage? Think about that. <laughs> you know, when you think, know how it unfolds, as, as what, what, like he did with giving away of his daughters. To me, there was more to this marriage than just bringing about the 12 tribes of Israel. This marriage was going to be part of Jacob's character building, uh, as most marriages are to anyone. But this one was unique. We know that he thought he married Rachel, but he woke up with Leah. Another set of emotions <laughs> that get thrown into all of this. And remember, Esau is still out there. Uh, what he did to his father, all that is still out there. Laban then tells him this was the custom. Of course, when did he tell him? After the fact. And I can see him thinking, thanks for the heads up. I might have done things a little differently if I had known that. Um, now to speak in, in Leah's defense for a, a little bit here, here's something else that gets thrown into the pot. Imagine this pot's getting bigger and bigger. What would it feel like to be given away at your sister's wedding? Would any of you ladies like to experience that? What would it be like to be given away at your sister's wedding? And he doesn't even know he's marrying until the next morning. I have no idea what that feels like. And I would not even want anyone to have to go through that, but she did. What would it do to her self-esteem to be never to be courted by the man you love? Because she really loved him. She really loved him, even though uh, he never picked her of his own. So anyway, um, then we come into a familiar scenario again in verse uh, 30. The story picks up. And he went in unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more. Sound familiar? Uh, and Leah. And served with him 
yet seven other years. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb and Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived, uh, excuse me, I'll stop there for a moment. Uh, it says Leah was hated. And I looked into that word. He didn't hate her. It was a, really a sister-in-law. How do you say it? Sister-in-law, wife, or wife, sister-in-law. I don't know. Um, it means less loved. It doesn't mean he didn't love him. Just like Isaac loved Jacob. He just loved Esau more. So it didn't mean I hate you. Um, he loved Rachel more, implying that he just loved Leah less. Uh, that's what... Um, that's that favoritism situation that Jacob would be very, very familiar with. Um, that would create a lot of resentment. And, but we can't expect him to love her more if he didn't want to marry her in the first place. But it creates an environment of growth again for Jacob and all involved. And then picking up with uh, verse 32, um, and Leah conceived and bare a son and called his name Reuben. And she said, surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction now Therefore, my husband will love me. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me his son also. And she called his name Simeon. And she conceived again and bare a son and called this time and, and said, Now this time my husband will be joined to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi. She keeps hoping that each child will be the one that will win her husband's love. She must have had many um, tear-filled night, tear nights when Jacob was with Rachel and not with her. It's heartbreaking to think about what that would put anyone through, man or woman, uh, to go through that. Even though you're producing these children for them that are the pride of the father in that day, big pride thing in that day it didn't get what she wanted then there was also the daily resentment between these two sisters that reared its ugly head frequently it must have been difficult to live in the same tent with these two women uh, at times and we get a hint of that in uh in chapter 30 the first two verses it says and when rachel saw that she was bare that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. And Jacob was angered, was kindled against Rachel and said, I am in God's, am I in God's stead? Who hath withheld the, the fruit of thy womb? Now I, could, I would suggest to you, this is one heated exchange. This isn't where they're just sitting at the dinner table and say, Jacob, give me some children before I die. I think she's screaming this. And he gets extremely angry. This, the, the emotions here are not possibly be able to record, but this is, this is no light conversation. She feels like she has nothing in her. Um, she keeps hoping, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, she keeps hoping that the child, each child will win her husband's love. That was uh, Leah, but it didn't. Um, that we can only imagine what it's doing to Rachel to be on the other end of the spectrum and can't produce one. A dead womb in that day, and it is still bad today, was, seemed to be it was even more back then because being barren was almost uh, more than one could bear. We have ways now of women having children that they didn't have even if they were barren. We can only imagine the frequent remarks that were perhaps exchanged between the two sisters. It's the uh, same story as Abraham trying to live under the same roof with Sarah and Hagar. The tension between them became so great that Hagar had to run away. And it's happening again. It says in Genesis 21 that it was very grievous to Abraham and Jacob was now in the very same situation. Each sister had something the other wanted. Leah wanted Jacob's love but gave him children and Rachel had his love but couldn't give him children. What a scenario. What, what a grenade that's going to ex probably explode normally. The whole 30th chapter, which I'm not going to read all the way through, depicts this conflict. In verse 8, um, it says, I'm just, we're just going to hopscotch through here. 
And Rachel said, with great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister. And I have prevailed, and she called his name Naphtali. So here, and she wrestled with her sister. Um, you know, Jacob wrestles with the angel. It's like wrestling with God. Uh, in verse 15, and she said unto her, it is a small matter that thou hast taken my husband. And wouldst thou take my son's mandrakes also? She feels like it's been taken away from her. These are, these are not good conversations at all. And then in, in uh, verse 20, it says, And Leah said, God hath endued me with a good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me. Wasn't he already? But not in, in the heart. They lived in maybe in the same tent. But that, that relationship that we crave from our spouse was not there. Um, just imagine if that conflict was going on in your home. This is the environment that, that Jacob lived in, at least as long as he's ch the childbearing years of these sisters. But who's to say how long the rivalry lasted between them? Jacob had this daily along with dealing with Laban's ways. All of this is part of what God is doing with him before he can see that man that he knows is there. It's removing those rough edges so that the man called Israel can surface living under the roof of a daily conflict tests your limits and teaches you things about yourself, good and bad. But you are refined by the process as long as God, you keep God in front of you at all times. And he was starting to do that. Now this is getting to where things change. You think of this 20 years have gone by when we get here. In chapter 31, it has been 20 years since he walked into Laban's life. Uh, the first five verses here. And he heard the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob hath taken away all that is your father's, and uh, that which our fathers had. He hath gotten all his glory. And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban, and behold, it was not towards him as before. And the Lord said unto Jacob, Return unto thy land, thy fathers, and to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. And Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah and the, uh, to the field and his flock, and said to them, I see your father's countenance, that it is not towards me before, but the God of my father hath been with me. Remember the before the if and when? That is now turned. He is convinced that of God's guidance. God has shown him that he is with him through these 20 years with all the pain that they've all gone through. Laban has even and this verse poisoned his sons against him. He's poisoned his sons against him. That's what he's done. Um, and he has come to believe and trust in God uh, through all of this and is starting to now show itself. Um, then we come to what is um, the, the big conflict that had been building between him and Laban all this time. Um, these two men have some serious venting to do with each other. And if we go to uh, start in verse 24, this is, would have been quite a conversation to be a fly, I guess, in that day on a tree, listening to this thing. And God came to Laban in verse 24, uh, the Syrian, in a dream by night, and said unto him, Take heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. Then Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mount, and Laban with his brethren pitched in the mount of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, what hast thou done? Thou hast stolen away unawares to me and carried away my daughters as captives taken with a sword. Wherefore didst thou flee away secretly and steal away from me and didst not tell me that I might have sent thee away with mirth and songs and tabard and with heart. And hast thou not suffered me to kiss my sons and my daughters? Thou hast done foolishly in so doing. It is in the power of my hand do you hurt. But God, your father, the God of your father has spake to me yesterday, saying, take heed that you'd speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. And now, though thou wouldst needs be gone, because thou sore longest after thy father's house, yet wherefore hast thou stolen my gods? So you can see the world he lived in, a man who worshiped other gods. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, Behold, because I was afraid, for I said, peradventure thou shouldest 
take by force thy daughters from me. With whosoever thou findest thy gods, let him not live. Before our brethren discern thou what is thine with me, and take it of thee. For Jacob knew not that Rachel had stolen them. And Laban went to Jacob's tent and to Leah's tent and into the tent to maidservants' tents, but they found them not. And when he went out of Leah's tent, he entered into Rachel's tent. And Rachel had taken the images and put them in the camel's furniture and sat upon them. And Laban searched all the tent, but found them not. Now imagine if somebody, your father-in-law, is coming to your house and is going through all of your belongings and all of your wives' belongings. That kind of just irritates you right there, the thought of that. This is what he is doing. Um, um, uh, verse 38, this 20 years have I been with thee. The ewes and my she-goats have not cast their young, the rams and the flocks I have not eaten. That which was torn of beast I brought not unto thee. I bear the loss of it, and my hand is not thou require of it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Thus I was in the day of the drought consumed me, the frost by night, and my sleep departed me, mine eyes. Thus have I been 20 years in thy house. I served thee 14 years <clears throat> for two daughters and six years for thy cattle, and thou hast changed my wages 10 times. Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac had been in with me, surely thou hast sent me away empty. God has seen my affliction. Here we go. He's now speaking it out and rebuked thee yesternight. And Laban answered and said unto Jacob, these daughters are mine daughters and these children are my children and these cattle are my cattle and all that thou seest is mine. What can I do this day unto these daughters and unto their children that they have born? Now therefore come thou let us make a covenant and I and thou, and let it be a witness between me and thee. This, um, when this truth, you could see what came out in this truth that they made and what he said. He realized that God is with him, but it took a while. It wasn't like 20 years to the day and suddenly he got it. He had been gradually going through this just as we did. Now, Esau's still out there, isn't he? Let's jump ahead to that one real quick. And um, in chapter 32, here's, and the whole time, this is in the back of his head. Esau is out there and he wants to kill me. So, uh, and Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And Jacob saw them and he said, this is God's host. And he called the name of the place Maranaham. Now, we don't, these angels met him, I believe, to strengthen him for what lay before him. He was going to need it. Now, we don't know what they said to him. The conversation is not there, but, you know, God sent angels to Christ. And we don't know what they said to him, but he was able to put one foot in front of the other. Jumping down to verse 6. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We have come, we came to thy brother Esau, and he cometh with 400 men with him. And Jacob was greatly afraid again and distressed. And he divided his people that was with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels that were in his hand. Now, 400 men. Why would Esau have that, this many men to greet his brother? I can offer two possibilities. By now, Esau knows that Jacob has become a great man and he is either coming to defend himself or to finish what he would do 20 years earlier. And that, he's, and that is, of course, to kill his brother. Now we start to see the great stress that was upon Jacob as the hour approached to meet his brother. In verse 9, we read, And Jacob said, Oh my, now listen to the tone of this from where before at the, uh, his, the ladder that he saw. Jacob said, O oh God of my father, Abraham, the God of, unto me, return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all thy mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed me unto thy servant. For with my staff I have, I have passed over this Jordan and now am I become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother and from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with children 
And thou saidest, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Now he is buying into it 100%. It's kind of like the epileptic father that came to Jesus and said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Even with the angels that came, he still was afraid. Verse 22, he says, And he rose up that night and took the two wives and the two women servants and the eleven sons and passed over the fords of Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over the hand. And Jacob was left alone and wrestled, uh, there wrestled a man with him until the break of day. Now he's left alone. Again, think about Christ. Uh, like Christ alone in the garden to find strength, he wrestled with the task that was before him. He wrestled with it. He asked God to remove it. Jacob's in a similar situation. He's alone, he's scared, and he's wrestling with this thing. Um, verse 25, and when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was thrown out of joint as he wrestled with him. Um, and he said, let me go, for there's daybreak. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, why, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And, he's, and he said, excuse me, thy name shall be no more Jacob, but Israel. This is that moment, that moment that God had promised. He has prevailed. Not will prevail, you have prevailed. The diamond is now cut to the proper, proper specifications. You have learned what I set out to teach you. And now he was clinging tight to God and would not let go because he had seen his guiding hand. As tough as life was, he saw the value of it. And then we come to, um, we know that he, in Genesis 33, I won't go through the whole story, but we know that he sent the children and all first, and they came before him. And you can imagine, you know, and he, he didn't know how Esau was going to react, but you know that Esau came and kissed him. Uh, Esau must have been going through his own purging. And, es and Jacob sent this, this blessing before all these cattle and everything. And it's interesting, now he's not taking a blessing, he's given a blessing to Esau. That's another thing I picked out of this, where before he took it, now he's, he's giving it. And you can imagine each of those children coming up to him, his nephews that he had never seen before, saying, hello, uncle. He saw whatever they would have said, you know, I'm, I'm Levi, I'm Reuben, I'm Joseph. Imagine that moment for Esau. What a story. What a story. A 20-year tale of a man encountered with the providential hand of God. And at the end, he could rightly bear the name of Israel, prince with God. And as we can see, being under the guiding hand of God not always brings an easy life. Most certainly, being under God's hand, guidance can be one of the most difficult things you will ever deal with during the certain points of your, our lives. And like Jacob, these events in our lives teach us to depend upon him and to trust him even when the future looks so dark, it is God chipping away at our rough edges to bring out the diamond in each one of us. So to our opening scripture of, of, in Genesis 47, I'll read that again. Now what, we've got all of that in our heads. Think about what he said to Pharaoh and what it implied uh, in verses 7 through 10. I'll read it again. And keep in mind, we're skipping over the 22 years he thought Joseph was dead. He still, uh, just because he got it, you know, made peace with Esau, it wasn't over yet. But the, man, the prince with God had come out. And Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and set him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, how old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of my years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been and have not attained unto the days and years of the life of my fathers and the days of their pilgrimage. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh 
and went out from before. Now, when we line up all that Jacob story, and you think about this moment when he's standing before Pharaoh, and he's 130 years old now, uh, what that means for him to say all that, it, it's, it's not to be taken lightly what it's implying. Brothers and sisters, um, our days also may be few and full of hardships. And sadness at times can seem, the sadness at times can seem absolutely crippling. Many times we've all wrestled with God um, and with the direction that he's taken us. And we fight it sometimes, but other times we hang on so tight. Um, we may feel that our lives are in constant turmoil at times. And sometimes we may feel that we just want out. But he has told us, as I've quoted many times in Romans 15, 4, that these things were written aforetime for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope, hope of the kingdom of God. So in those difficult times in our lives, when we may be wrestling with God, we need to hold on tight, just like Jacob did with that angel. And don't let go, and the blessing will come. And I thought it very interesting. You know, Jacob was given a new name. In Revelations uh, chapter 2, verse 17, I'll close with this verse. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth save in he that receiveth it. So keep that in mind when you think about Jacob got a new name. We're told we'll get one too. We will be given a new name like Jacob. Thank you.